Hi, how are you? I'm good. How are you today? Good. My name is Carlton Cartwright. Okay. I'm the Executive Director for the Children's Coalition Incorporated. Okay, and we are here today at the Clifford Chester Sims Veterans State, Veterans State Nursing. Nursing Home in Springfield, Florida. Florida. Thank you. <laughs> yes. That's a long, long name. <laughs> okay. And um, I got an assist today from um, Kathy, what's your last name? Wallace. Wallace, who um, is um, a staff um, employee here at the nursing home facility. And um, today's date is December 23rd, 2019. And um, we are here today to interview... Um, Miss, what is your name? Margaret Paul. All right, Margaret. And um, when is your birthday? November 13th, 1965. Okay, and what is your current address? 1204 Crooked Lane, Southport, Florida, 32409. Okay, and where were you born? In Santa Clara, California. Oh, okay. All right. All I'm right. a long way from home. Right. What, um... What branch of the service were you in? I was in the United States Navy. Okay. Hold on. Uh, what, uh, what year did you serve? I enlisted in June, I went to boot camp in June of, 2000, of 1984, mm -hmm. and I retired in June of 2004. And you said you enlisted, right? Yes. Okay, where were you living at the time? I was living in a very small community in Woodside, California. Uh -huh. And what were you doing at that moment? I was in high school up until I joined, and then I was in delayed entry from October of the year I graduated until June when I went to boot camp. You were in delayed entry? Mm-hmm. Okay, and um, was that while you were in high school? I enlisted right after high school, like right out of high school. Okay. And my parents had to sign the paperwork, so I was only 17. Uh-huh. Okay. Uh, oh, all right, all right. So, what was life like before you went into service? I grew up in a very rural community. Um, but the best way to describe it is it was Walton's Mountain. <laughs> um, we lived, uh, we had gardens, we had wood-burning stoves, my mom made everything from scratch. I went to a very small high school in Half Moon Bay, California. Um, my graduating year we topped a thousand students, wow. so it was pretty small. Okay. And um, yeah, I grew up working on cars, laying sheetrock, doing all kinds of stuff. Oh yeah. <laughs> We were, we were a multi-purpose family when I mean, you did everything. My sisters could do electrical work I could, and plumbing, but I didn't learn that. We had built our house too far by that point for me to learn the electrical and plumbing. So okay. I did the sheetrocking and working with brickwork and working on cars. And Why did you choose the Navy? Well, actually, I didn't choose the Navy. I chose the Marine Corps first until I found out they didn't have a medical corps, and they told me to go across the hall to the Navy, so that's what I did. <laughs> I walked into the Marine Corps recruiting office and I want to be a WM, but I want to be in the medical. And they said, nope, we don't have that. Go across the hall. What is the WM? Woman Marine. Uh-huh. Okay, so. So I went across the hall and I talked to the guys in the Navy recruiting office. And they told me they can't, couldn't guarantee me to go to core school because it was one of those sought-after rates. Uh -huh. And so I told them that I wouldn't join unless I could go to core school. So they asked if I would do all the enlistment paperwork first. And... I made sure that I wasn't actually on active duty, and they kept telling me the whole time, we can't guarantee it, we can't guarantee it, and I kept telling them, well, I'm not going to join if you can't give it to me. <laughs> so they finally relented and gave it to me. They said I had some pretty high ASVAB scores. They wanted me to go nuclear, but women weren't in nuclear at the time, so. Uh -huh. They wanted you to go nuclear? Yeah, they were just trying to get me to sign up, so. Okay. Yeah, they were, you know, <laughs> oh, you, you qualify for nuclear, you could do that, uh -huh. but women weren't doing nuclear at the time, so. So. They were just being used car salesmen. <laughs> <laughs> they wanted a body to fill a slot, so. Uh, okay, so, I mean, what would that have entailed if you had taken, if you had accepted that? Oh, God, I don't know. I'm just, you, you don't know I, either. No, I don't I'm know. I'm I didn't want to find yeah. out. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Good. Um, all right, now we know why you chose the Navy. Yes, that's why I chose. <laughs> oh, well, and, and my sister was already in the Air Force. Oh. So I wasn't going to do the Air Force because I didn't want to compete with her, and the Army took anybody. So I wanted something a little more elite than the Army. <laughs> okay. <laughs> hey, that was my belief at the time. This gets so. better all the time. <laughs> <laughs> all right. 
right? <laughs> so, um, well, where was your first duty base? Well, actually, I, and I, when I say that, I mean, where did you go for basic training? Orlando, Florida. Okay. Um, where, where in Orlando? Uh, Navy Recruit Training Center. Okay. And uh, where that's at in Orlando? Well, I know it doesn't exist anymore. Where no. it was at the time, I have no idea. I arrived there in the middle of the night on a bus. Okay. How long were you there? Uh, a few months, whatever boot camp was. Six, eight weeks? Yeah, whatever. Yeah. It was hot. It was miserable. And What, um, what time I, of year was it? What it was month? June. Oh. And unfortunately, I had a seizure right after I got there and spent the first 24 to 48 hours in the emergency room and had selective amnesia. Wow. So I don't have any memories prior to going to boot camp that are, so I can't tell you. I know we went to a hotel room um, between MEPS and Orlando, and I was at a hotel, and I remember a guy named Cowboy, and that's all I can remember prior to um, boot camp. Okay. Because the seizure wiped out a little bit of my memory. Okay. So tell me what you remember about boot camp. Um, it was hilarious. <laughs> um, I was raised in a very strict household. You used proper manners. You did what you were told when you were told to do it. Uh -huh. I had never been around a bunch of women before. Um, I found out I didn't really care for women very much while I was in boot camp <laughs> because they were shallow, insipid, uh, most of the time, they didn't know what the hell they were doing. Uh -huh. um, it was so easy. You just followed the rules. And I couldn't understand why they just wouldn't follow the rules and just do what they were told to do when they were told to do it. And then we got kicked off the firing range because they were pointing loaded weapons at everybody and shooting out the ceilings and the walls. I was like, I was, I was floored. I did not realize that people were actually like that. Um, I was used to my small community. And, you know, being held accountable for what you do, and, wow, it was an eye-opener. I was also raised by very racist parents. Okay. So that was my first time being around anybody that wasn't Puerto Rican or Caucasian. All right. <laughs> or, not Puerto Rican, I'm sorry, Portuguese. The town I went to high school in, it was very Portuguese strong. Portuguese. Portuguese, yes. Okay. And this was in California. Yes. All right. Okay. Yeah. So I had a very, How did that work very, for you? Uh, it was awesome. Oh, you? Okay. I didn't believe what my parents were trying to teach me when we were growing up. Why? Um, um, that couldn't be right. Not all black people could be that way. Okay. And it was mostly, it was mostly against black people, honestly. Uh -huh. um, and then when I got to boot camp, of course, that reinforced my opinion that my parents were wrong. And they still are. They're still very racist. Okay. <laughs> it was an interesting, boot camp was really interesting. I it see. was funny though. I see. I laughed most of the time. In fact, my uh, CCs couldn't remember my name. They always called me Smiley. And, and <laughs> so, um, <laughs> this is astonishing. Okay, no, it's just you putting a smile on my face. Anyway. Good, thank you. <laughs> that's, no, it's, I, I needed it too. So, what, I'm just jumping ahead, when you finally separated, what rank were you? I was at E6. Okay. Well, I kept getting passed over for chief. Nobody could tell me why. So I hit higher tenure and was forced to retire. And I did not want to. Huh? I did not want to retire. Okay. I wanted oh. to stay for 30 if I could have. How long did you stay? 20. Oh, you did 20? When I joined, I wanted to do 20, mm -hmm. make E6, and go gold. And I did all three. What's go gold? What is that? Um, in the Navy, if you go 12 years mm -hmm. without getting in trouble, mm -hmm. you all your red hash marks and your rating insignia turn gold. Oh. So okay. I went gold. Probably meant more money too, right? No. No? Just, just prestige. Just, okay. You all just right. didn't get in trouble. No, there was no money. Uh -huh. It's the military. What, what was the title of E6? <laughs> I was a hospital corpsman first class. Okay. Well, no, I mean, I asked that. Yeah. It was managed, it was a higher rank. No, gold is just prestige. That was the correlation I was trying to make with yeah. the pay. That's no, all. Yeah, it's not Got a it. higher rank. It's just prestige. Okay. You didn't get in trouble. Mm -hmm. Or as some people say, you didn't get caught. <laughs> Leave that alone. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so, um, we, um, I'm, this is fascinating. So tell me about your relationships. Did you... Uh, this is, I'm going to ask you 50 more questions right now. Go ahead. No, I don't have the time. Oh, so, <laughs> <laughs> Okay. 
Okay, so um, was it strenuous, arduous, uh, your, your physical training, your mental training? The physical training was hard for me because up until I went to Japan, I thought I had to run the physical fitness test. Mm -hmm. And in the, in, you can, in the Navy, you can actually swim it also. But I didn't realize that. Um, and so I tried to run. I'm not a runner. I will never be a runner. Um, people would ask me when I would train if I was okay and needed to go to the emergency room because I looked so gross. Okay. Um, <laughs> Mental-wise, um, parts of it were, but for the most part, it was the right fit for me. It was exactly what I was supposed to be doing. Okay. So I was um, a physical therapy technician for the most of my career. Yep. And... I truly loved it. I was so blessed that I picked medical, that I got to go to physical therapy school. Um, it was just, it was perfect for me. I had the right mindset. I had the right attitude. Um, I just didn't have the right paperwork. Okay. Because when you go for chief, your record goes before the board. In the right. Navy, you have to take a, a test um, to see if you're board eligible. And I always made 95th percentile on that test. So I was in the top 5% right. scoring. And whatever was in my record was not enough to get me selected for chief. Wow. And that was the last year that I was on active duty. It was probably the hard, not last year I was on active duty. The last year I was eligible for chief was probably the hardest year. Mm -hmm. That was probably the most emotionally trying because that's when I found out that I was going to have to retire, that they were not going to accept me as a chief petty officer. And that my career was over. Okay. Sorry about that. Thank you. Do you remember your um, any of your instructors? In boot camp, um, we had one of my career uh, CCs. Her last name was Butts. Uh -huh. I had a black woman and a white woman. Okay. And we were the first and last company. So the white woman, we were her last company. For the black woman, we were her first company. She was the nicer of the two because mm -hmm. she wasn't jaded yet being a CC. <laughs> At that time, Corman couldn't be CC. What is a CC? A company commander. Got it. And Corman couldn't be company commanders back then because it was considered a non-humanitarian position. Okay. I know. Pretty interesting. Now yeah. they can be. Um, so, um, but I don't remember the other. I don't. I don't remember which was which. All right. Because that was quite. A, that was a few years ago. No, I understand. <laughs> I, I understand. Um, uh, before we move on to tech school, were there any casualties in basic training, especially out on that uh, the gun range? No, nobody died. Um, we did have some attrition, um, but nobody died. No one died. Okay, what do you mean by attrition? Oh, just people that didn't make it. They had to be recycled. Oh, really? And I was I was lucky. Even with my seizure, they should have recycled me, uh -huh. but they didn't. For whatever reason, I was allowed to continue. Uh -huh. Never had any more seizures. Um, it was a blood sugar drop that oh. was very drastic. I actually passed out in the chow hall right after getting lunch. Wow. Okay. So, um, okay. All right. Um, so... On to tech school? Yeah. Where was that? That was at Great Lakes uh, Naval Hospital. Oh, okay. And how, do you know how long you were there? Um, and then again, a couple months. That was for hospital core school. Okay. And we graduated in November, and it was cold. And the Navy, in their infinite wisdom, like women to be in heels and short skirts in the winter, at attention, and freezing our tuchuses off. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that again. <laughs> You're going to get all the apologies that you should have gotten over the years from me today. <laughs> okay. it was, yeah, but it was it was core school was fun. That uh -huh. was a lot of fun. Um, the training was really good. Um, you know, there's a lot of pride with being a hospital corpsman because we are the best trained medical enlisted group in the military. Okay, our training is is very comprehensive. We don't just work in the hospital or in the clinic. We're tested on hospital core knowledge that encompasses all of the medical side, but also food service, sanitation, dental hygiene. Um, setting up field kitchens, um, doing um, just all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's it's much more comprehensive than being a medic. Right. So um, a little anyway, just clear that up for us. So did you do all of those things, or did you were you in the medical field? I was mostly in the medical. I worked at uh, mostly in hospitals and clinics. Uh -huh. And I was a general duty corpsman when I was at Pax River, which was my first duty station. All right. Then let's slow down. All right, so you but you learned all those skills while you were in training. You we learned most of it from book, yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. all right, all right. So, and after the Great Lakes, now where was your first duty station? Naval Air Station, pa Pax River, Maryland. Okay, and how long were you there? Uh, two years. What year was that? 
You uh, started. I got there in 84 and left in 86. And so what was that all about? Um, that was where you learn how to just start doing your job. Mm -hmm. um, it was a small branch clinic on a naval, uh, naval, air naval air test station. So they tested a lot of aircraft and there was a pilot training school there too. Okay. Um, really beautiful base. And I worked every department there except for OBGYN. So I worked in x-ray, I worked in the laboratory, I worked on the wards, I worked in family practice, I worked everything, immunizations, um, and I was work, drove the ambulances there, um, worked in the emergency room, met my husband, well my first husband, only husband technically, but you know, that's where we met and got married and so it was, it was just the beginning. Gotcha. Okay, so um, up to this point, uh, were there any casualties or anybody get hurt in your in training at the Great Lakes? No. And for the two year period that you were in Maryland? No. No, no fatalities or any injuries. Not anybody that I knew. Okay. We had lots of fatalities. I worked in an emergency room. Oh, really? Yeah. So we had a nursing home down the road called Amber House, mm -hmm. and so any veteran that died at Amber House was brought to our emergency room. And our policy at the time was we would have to work on anybody that came through our door for two hours before we could declare them dead, even if they already had rigor mortis setting in. Okay. So we would work on, do blood gases and CPR on them um, until the blood gases, enough blood gases came back signifying that, yes, yes they were actually deceased. Mm -hmm. They only didn't, they did not do that two-hour rule on one victim that was found floating because you couldn't work on him. Uh-huh. Um, and, and, you know, there were other obvious ones. Um, we had a couple of plane crashes. Um, that happened more in Iwakuni, Japan, than we had at Pax River. Um, and so we had a couple of fatalities from, you know, the planes crashing. Okay. And we had a couple of children that died while I was on while I was in the emergency room. Uh-huh. So yeah, I've, I've seen death, and I've worked. We had a couple of people pass away on our ward while I was on duty. Mm -hmm. And so we have to bag and tag them. We get very cavalier talking about death, unfortunately. I understand. Um, were there any engagements of uh, war going on uh, where you got um, people who had suffered no. from overseas that came to your location? No, no. They would never come to PAX. That okay. was too small. There were some when I was in San Diego. Oh, really? So that, but that was many years later. Okay. So after uh, Maryland, you should call it PAX. Yeah, that's what we called it, PAX River. Patuxent River Naval Air Station was called PAX. And what did that stand for? Patuxent. It was just shortened Patuxent. Oh, okay, got yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. They just it was easier to say Patch River than to say Patuxent River. Okay. Just, and so your next duty station was actually Fort Sam Houston, San Antonio, Texas. And how long were you there? What years? That oof, that would have been eighty six. <laughs> that would have been eighty six because I went to physical therapy school there. Okay. I did phase one physical therapy school, and then I went to Camp Pendleton and did phase two. Okay. Uh, what's phase one and phase two? Phase two is books. Phase two is practical. Okay. Oh, you so you're still in training. Right. But you going to well, a new was duty going, base. Well, that was no. That was my C school. In the Navy, they have A schools and C schools. So your A school for us was hospital core school. Uh huh. And then you get an NEC, Navy Enlisted Classification Code, if you want to further your career. Um, as a general duty corpsman, our NEC was quad zero. Mm, okay. As a physical therapy technician, it was eighty. 8406? Something like that, 8406. And that just is a four-digit code designating your Naval Enlisted Classification Code, what your specialty is. So I went to physical therapy school and did that uh, for the rest of my career until I became a career counselor the last two years I was on active duty. Okay. All right. Um, what was the next? Okay, so... in. Uh, Houston, Texas? Fort Sam Houston. Fort Sam, Houston. okay. Yep. Right, um, and you were, well, it seems like you were there for two years also? No, that was only a few months oh. um, just to do physical therapy school. Mm -hmm. And what was neat about that was going through Brook Army Medical Center, uh -huh. which is where a lot of our combat wounded go. And we did have quite a few very severely wounded individuals that were there. I didn't actually get to work with them, but I did get to visit them. Where were they coming in from? I, I don't know. Okay. At that time, we weren't given those kind of details. Um, we just had to go through. We were primarily going through learning about burn care. Uh-huh. 
And so we went through the burn ward and saw all the victims that had serious either electrical or traditional type burns. Okay, so what was that all about? What was that like? Um, well, I was a corpsman. It was interesting. <laughs> That's, you know, that was your we, job. Yeah, it's yeah. my job. By that point, you know, um, a lot of people think I'm weird because I like looking at blood and gore. I like looking at wounds. It's it's interesting to me. It's not weird. I'm just, yeah, I shouldn't just, even. I don't even have to clear this up for you. Certain people can only do certain jobs. Yes, exactly. So. Um, and I was very well suited for doing wound care. I was one of the ones that, when I was at Long Beach, that was one of my major jobs was doing wound care because I could get the wounds clean and, you know. I wasn't as um, soft-hearted as some other people. <laughs> I'm trying to remember the term for that, but um, you didn't have a weak stomach. No. There no. you go, that one. No weak stomach. Right, okay. So after uh, physical therapy school, I went to Long Beach Naval Hospital. I was there for seven years. Really? As my parent command, but I worked at Branch Clinic El Toro and Branch Clinic Naval Station San Diego, or Long Beach, in between, you know, because it was my parent command, and the branch clinics fell under that parent command. Okay. So um, I was there until they closed Long Beach Naval Hospital. Mm -hmm. And what year was that? Seven um, years, yeah. That had wow. been 92? Uh huh. 93. Nope. Yeah, 93 is when they closed uh, Long Beach Naval Hospital. Okay. Right after Desert Shield, Desert Storm. Right after? Yeah. Okay, so you got a. You got a I guess you got casualties from the Middle East? No, because they were closing us. Oh. Uh, so Long where did you get... Where, um, again, I think I asked you, but just to keep it straight. San Diego. There were some in San Diego. There were what? Some casualties came, I saw in San Diego. All right. But, okay, so did you get any from overseas? Not while I was in Long Beach, no. All right. So that was a seven-year tour. Yes. All right. And how did you get along with... Uh, up to this point, by the way, how did you get along with officers as well as enlisted? The medical community is completely different from the rest of the military. Um, it's a much tighter, uh, supportive environment, and in physical therapy, it's even smaller and tighter. Uh -huh. So I only had one um, um, department head that uh -huh. I did not get along with the whole time I was there. What was the and problem? She was a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> okay. She was manipulative. She lied. She used our personal information against us. She you tried to use bribery. Um, she was not an officer. She was... I'd call her a Democrat now, but... <laughs> but we'll just leave that alone. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, she just... She had an agenda that didn't... It wasn't right being on active duty. You don't do that kind of garbage. She tried to bribe me. Um, she tried to. What? How did? What? For what? Why would she try uh, to bribe me? Why? She wanted me to be back at the hospital. I was at the clinic at the time. Uh -huh. I was down at the Naval uh, Stations Branch Clinic, and um, the assistant LPO we had was very ineffectual. She just she didn't know how to do her job, and so they wanted to replace her with me. They wanted me to come back. And I, she had t promised me that I would get the branch clinic if I continued my orders at Long Beach because my husband and I were both active duty at the time. And he was stationed on board a ship. And I didn't want to just go down a few miles down to San Diego or another duty station close by, you know, and have to do all of that changing. So she said, if you take the branch clinic, you know, will you stay? I'll give you the branch clinic. So, okay, I'll stay. Well, then she wanted me to come back, and she denied any knowledge of our agreement. Even after I asked her a couple times, she still denied it. Then she tried to give me a Navy Achievement Medal if I would go out to 29 Palms with her and help her close down the clinic there. And at that point, I already knew what kind of person she was, so I told her no. Okay. Because she also didn't have the authority to give me a NAM. <laughs> That's got to be a, a, a... It goes above just a department head level. Right. Okay. Well, so, yeah. Sorry about that experience. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but for the most part, everybody else I worked with, in fact, I'm in contact with a lot of them still. Really? Mm -hmm. that, that's one of the questions I was going to ask you. So you maintain friendships from oh, over yeah. the years? Over the years. I'm friends with people that, um, not anybody I was stationed with at PAX, but a lot of people I was stationed with at Long Beach, mostly in Japan. Uh -huh. Japan was a much um, tighter community all around so uh -huh. you just you you made lots of friends and very close connections 
Okay. So after Long Beach was Japan, we went to Iwakuni, that was Marine Corps Air Station, Iwakuni, Japan. And I was stationed at the Bratch Clinic there, and yes, there were fatalities, lots of fatalities while we were there. Um, some very serious traumatic injuries. Um, we had a couple pilots go down, they were hot dogging down a canyon, and they hit the canyon wall. So they brought them in by pieces. A few months after their majority went home, they found one of their thumbs and brought that in. Um, we had a young Marine that, was, that fell off a bridge. He became a spastic quadriplegic, so he was, had some spinal cord damage in his neck and he had no voluntary control over his limbs. We had a young girl that had a, the newspaper machine door. She climbed in to get a paper out and it fell down and impaled behind her skull and it was embedded in her skull, so they had to transport her with the door. We had a Japanese national um, get knocked over backwards um, on the baseball diamond and split his cranial suture. <laughs> they all survived. Um, the one that uh, died was one of my patients. He was, a, he was one of my patients in physical therapy, and he was in a, an accident, and he was transported to the Japanese hospital where he died because they didn't work him up properly, and he had a pelvic fracture, and he bled out. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you were overseas at the time? Yeah, that's when I was stationed in Japan. In Japan, right? And I was there for three years. Uh-huh. That's where my, my son was born just before we left for Japan. Oh. And that was that was very interesting, living overseas. In what respect? Um, J the Japanese culture is amazing, but it's completely different from anything that we're used to. Uh-huh. Um, and uh, you just... You have to learn a whole new way of living over there, you know, with the, the money changing, uh, the culture, the driving, the food. Um, and if you're not an open person, being overseas would be really horrible. But we loved it. <laughs> okay. It was awesome. Uh -huh. uh, so, how many years were you there? Three years. So, what, what time is it now that, that you left? That was 94 or 90, yeah, 94 to 97. And next? was San Diego Naval, Naval Hospital. How long? Seven years. That was the end of my career. That was the end. Okay. So tell us about that. What I were you doing a, there? I was a physical therapy technician there. Uh, mm -hmm. um, at first I was just a, one of the techs. Then I became the um, assistant LPO. And at that time there was only three chief petty officers that were physical therapy technicians in the Navy. What happens when you make E7 as um, a physical therapy technician is you lose your NEC and you go back to being a quad zero corpsman. Uh -huh. and, um, but because Long Beach was, or not Long Beach, San Diego was such a large physical therapy clinic, we were the largest physical therapy clinic in the Navy. We had five branch medical clinics plus the main hospitals clinic, which was immense. So they had a chief petty officer there. And so he was, so then we had, I was his assistant for a while. Then he left, and instead of getting a new chief, they decided to make me LPO. So I was in charge of the entire place, and that was in an effort to get me picked up for chief. Okay. And so I ran the largest physical therapy clinic in the Navy. I ran the largest watch bill at Balboa. Um, it was comprised of E6s, and we stood a 20, we stood three section watch during the week and two section on the weekend, and I had to coordinate over 60 people. Um, with this watch bill. And unfortunately, while I was on duty, um, I was informed of one of our former physical therapy technicians that had committed suicide. Mm -hmm. He was a SEAL. He was at BUDS. He was the, the physical therapy tech attached to the SEALs unit there in San Diego. What is BUD? Bud or BUDS? BUDS is a, the basic training to become um, a SEAL. It's the, oh, I just, underwater demolition, something, basic underwater demolition. Okay. And that's part of SEAL training, is BUDS. And okay. he was there as their physical therapy technician, and he went home and committed suicide. Wow. Yeah. Worked with a lot of Marines. We worked with some that had, that had combat injuries. Um, not a lot of the major injuries were at San Diego, because most of them go to Balboa, or not Balboa, go to uh, Bethesda and Walter Reed. Mm -hmm. So San Diego, we saw some of the lesser ones. Um, so not any real major trauma but not like what you would see with limbs missing and stuff like that. But my ex-husband, he was at Desert Shield, Desert Storm. Okay. So I was also a Navy wife and on active duty the whole time. A lot of fun. Yeah. Especially when his ship replaced the USS Stark, and the Stark is the one that got hit in the Gulf. And all we knew was that a frigate had been hit in the Gulf that day.
What's his name? His name is Asa Paul. Okay. And he, stay, he lives here somewhere. Okay. So, how did you react? When I found out that a, that a frigate had been hit in the Gulf, I tried everything I could to find out the name of the ship, but they weren't releasing the name because they uh -huh. hadn't notified all the families yet. Uh -huh. So, and you know, back then there was no instant communication like there is now, so I had no idea if he... I knew he wasn't dead because I didn't get a knock at the door, but he was on a frigate. Um, his ship was USS Vandegrift. And he was one of two corpsmen, so if they had been hit, his work would have been intense because of, you know, rescuing all the, you know, the victims. But the Stark had replaced them a day early, so they were actually a day out of that area when the Stark got hit. Okay. So I was very relieved when I found out it wasn't his ship. Right. And then um, later on, he got deployed to Desert Shield, Desert Storm as one of the corpsmen. He was on the front lines. He was with... with with an artillery unit out of 29 Palms, um, and so he was on the front lines. And that was not fun either. No, I'm sure. I'm so sure. He saw a lot of casualties. Um, had, he, he likes to tell a story about having to pull all of his Marines off of a burning tank that had live ammunition all around it. Okay. Okay, we've had our moment of silence. <laughs> yeah. That's, so, it's never, you know, it's... It's not easy. There's a lot of emotion. People don't understand the, even when you're not in combat or, you know, even if you only do a couple of years, they don't understand the, the depth of emotion that people go through, how much work they do. You know, when I was in Japan, I was on a three-section watch. I was standing at 24-hour duty every three days and working a 40-hour week. And I had an infant son and a husband. Wow. You can't have a life when you're doing that. Right. You, you know, you just, you just do what you're supposed to do. So, let's talk about R&R &R for a moment. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Besides the places that you already told me that you were stationed, mm -hmm. and we did get to your final duty station, correct? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where did you go on R&R? &R? What did you do? Like, um, from place to place to place, so to so speak. Sorry. It's okay. Um, well, I would always go up and visit my family. Where? Um, Back up in, in Northern California. Uh -huh. So it was nice being in Long Beach and San Diego because it was 10 to 12 hour drive back up to where I grew up. Mm -hmm. So most Christmases we would go up there. Um, you just found fun wherever you could. I mean, there was a few uh, military facilities that we would go um, to and, and play at. You know, there's um, Solomon's Island and Pax River is a military recreation facility. That uh -huh. was a neat place. Long Beach had some um, areas reserved for military only. Pendleton has wonderful beaches. San Onofre is a beautiful beach at Camp Pendleton. Um, but, you know, since we lived, uh, Japan was the most fun, probably, just getting to go around and see different parts of Japan. We worked a lot, so we didn't get to go out very much. Then we went up to Hiroshima a few times. Um, we went to the Iwakuni's castle. Um, they have a castle in Iwakuni that was not very far from the base. We went to the Hatsi Baths, which are the inside and outside hot springs and baths and things like that. Right. There was a really cool island that had a toll bridge most of our time while we were there, so we never went. But then they, they paid off the bridge, they got rid of the toll, so we went over the island and had a wonderful experience over there um, with the nationals. We were the only Caucasians on the beach, and um, we were playing with my son. And, and this person started walking around handing out plastic grocery bags to everybody. Mm -hmm. And they handed us one, and we're like, okay, we've got a plastic grocery bag. And then this boat pulls up and threw something on shore, and then went out and made a big U-turn and came back and threw something else on shore. And we were pretty far away from where this was happening at, so we, that's why we, I didn't know what it was. It turned out it was a net. They were throwing the, everybody each end of a drag net. Oh. And so then we started getting motioned over. And so we go over and we start hauling in the net and we dragged up all these fish and everybody's grabbing the fish out of the water and throwing them in bags and that was their dinner for the night. It was so amazing. There you go. You know, and uh, yeah, it was just, and then another time we went out to um, Cherry Blossom Festival. That's a very big celebration in Japan. Uh -huh. And it's, and it was our last year there. And so we're sitting on the bank of the river eating our lunch. And this person came up behind us and in very perfect English asked if we were Europeans, and we said no, we're Americans, we're stationed on base. Turned around, it was a Japanese gentleman, so that's right. why I was very surprised. He was very perfect English, no accent, no, no nothing. Well, this gentleman was raised 20 minutes from where I grew up, 
was huh. visiting his Japanese family in Japan. Right. He spoke no Japanese. Huh. His Hawaiian wife was the interpreter. <laughs> he had helped liberate concentration camps during World War II. Wow. So we chatted for a little while and he left. And then a little while later he came back and asked us to come join his family for Cherry Blossom Festival. Okay. So we went down there and um, they do it a huge. Cherry Blossom Festival is huge. Uh -huh. So they, a lot of families will rent these raised platforms and they will buy um, multi-tiered bento boxes which are um, box lunches full of all kinds of yummy things and the bigger the box the more expensive a small box usually runs about twelve to fifteen dollars the ones they had were like fifty to sixty dollars a piece and they gave us each one and then they had tons of beverages and we just sat around talking with this amazing group of people mm -hmm. and, and you know it was, it was just a neat day great way to end our trip in Japan you speak any Japanese? I speak very little and I've lost a lot of it. Yeah. No yeah. no No one to talk to. Right. And you know, Japanese is a very difficult language to learn under the best of circumstances. Right. But while we were there, there were teachers that were trying to get their teaching certificate. In order to get your teaching certificate, you have to have so many hours of um, hands-on teaching experience. So they were offering free Japanese classes. Okay. And so uh, my friend and I, we went out and we took those classes. It was a lot of fun. Okay. Okay, well, moving right now is fascinating. <laughs> uh, you never saw any combat. Never saw any combat, Okay, no. all right, all right. Um, good, good for you. Well, you saw enough. <laughs> That's for sure. Being, hey, yeah, being what, in an emergency room is hard. Uh, did you ever receive any what um, awards, medals, citations? Um, I've got a couple Navy Achievement Medals. I've got um, all my good conduct medals. Mm -hmm. So every four years, um, uh, the Navy personnel get a good conduct award. And you get a hash mark that goes on your dress uniform. And then, like I said earlier, if you go over 12 years and you haven't gotten in trouble, everything goes gold. Right. And so while I was in Japan is when I went gold. Okay. And, um, and then I've got, a, I've got a marksman. I was having too much fun on the pistol range, so I missed sharpshooter by a couple points. Uh -oh. um, <laughs> and <laughs> overseas um, to service ribbons and so okay. and lots of letters of appreciation and all that stuff. So when it came time to get out of the service, what were you thinking about? Just what was on your mind as you, was, well, as you were preparing go. to separate? I didn't want to go. You didn't want to? I didn't want to leave the Navy. Okay. I was being forced to leave because I hit higher tenure. Uh -huh. So as an E6, you can only do 20 years. And since they wouldn't pick me up for E7, I was, I was out the door. So by that point, I, I had come to um, accept it, I guess. Uh -huh. I wasn't happy about it, but at least I was retiring. Which So I made my last goal. You know, I wanted to make E6 go gold and do 20 years. Right. So at least I had achieved all my goals that I set when I went to boot camp. And um, didn't know what I was going to do. I was, going, I was in college, um, going through University of Phoenix, getting my uh, bachelor's in business administration. Mm -hmm. And um, I didn't know what I was going to do with it. Didn't know where we were going to go. We were pretty sure it settled on moving here. This is where my ex-husband is from. He's from Panama City. Right. So we were going to retire here mm -hmm. and then just see where life led us. We really didn't have much of a plan after that. Okay, so you say that, but I, I understand that you're a mental health professional? Yes. Um, when I got here, um, my physical therapy degree, I don't have a degree. I should the school that I went through, when I went through Fort Sam, they were not affiliated with any college. So mm -hmm. I didn't get a degree like a lot of people before and after me did. Right. When my ex-husband and I joined, we joined in a magic little window where we had one opportunity to get the uh, Montgomery GI Bill. Okay. Switching over from VEEP, Veterans Era, Education, whatever plan, to Montgomery GI Bill. We were told that it was not a good idea to enroll in it at that point because it was getting switched over and we would get another opportunity later on when they had open enrollment. Mm -hmm. So we, of course, said, okay, no, we won't take it. So we signed the paperwork. And when I left the Navy, I had never been given the opportunity to get the Montgomery GI Bill. Every time they had open enrollment, it was if you enlisted before this date or after this date, and we fell in between those dates. So I did what's called a Board of Correction for Naval Records request, asking to get the Montgomery GI Bill. I was getting all the, you know, I had money saved up. I could put it all up front, and I cited the fact that I was never given an opportunity, like I was told in boot camp, to um, enroll in the Montgomery GI Bill. It came back denied because we were given one opportunity in 1986 when I was out on an army base and he was underway. So we never saw the message traffic. 
Okay. So I had no educational benefits leaving the Navy. Wow. So um, I got here. I started pursuing, looking at into doing physical therapy, but because I didn't have a degree, even though I was licensed to practice physical therapy in California, I didn't have a degree. So Florida doesn't have any reciprocity with any other state for physical therapy, so they would not accept my California license. So in order to do physical therapy, I would have to go back to school to learn what I had been doing for 17 years. Mm -hmm. I didn't like that. Um, I convinced them to let me do half the program, but I still didn't like it. Um, then I found out about vocational rehab. And since I have got a 20% disability rating, I went down and talked to the guys at the VA here. It was way down on Jenks Avenue at that time. I don't know where it's at now. I think it's downtown. Um, but they told me that I qualified for voc rehab. So I drove up to Fort Walton Beach and talked to them, and at first they were going to say no, but then they changed their mind because my job at the time was aggravating my neck, which is part of my disability. Mm -hmm. And so they sent me to get my master's in counseling and psychology. <laughs> and that's how I became a counselor. Okay. <laughs> so I finally got my educational benefits. I was going to get them come hell or high water, and I finally got them. <laughs> I, so. I, I sense a small, mar a small, small amount of your personality is, <laughs> is, is in, in overdrive as far as determination and, and, and the sort of aggressive when you get ready. Okay. Yes. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, that's excellent. Good for you. So, um, last few questions. Mm -hmm. um, did your military experience influence your thinking about war or about the military in general? Well, yeah. Um, I was already very pro-military, even mm -hmm. as a young kid. Um, right. My mom took my brother and I to Boston when we were kids. We did the Freedom Walk, and I got to go on to the most amazing ship in the world, the U.S.'s Constitution. Oh, okay. She is absolutely fabulous. Mm -hmm. um, I just, I was so honored that I got to go on board her and see her, and, and you know, I'm very fascinated by her career. She's the oldest military ship we have. She's never been decommissioned. She is still manned by active duty personnel. Right. They wear period uniforms, but they also wear you know, regular uniforms. They have to maintain her and do all her rigging and everything. It's amazing. One of my good friends got to do her chief's initiation on board uh, the Constitution. And then when I was a few years older, I got to go on the USS Enterprise when she was stationed in Alameda, California. And so the military, I mean, it's, it wasn't ever part of our family, but I've got a huge family military history. Mm-hmm. My dad was Navy before he married my mom. Both my father, my father-in-law, my my um, stepfather-in-law were Navy. My uncle was retired Navy. My other my two uncles retired Navy. My brother was Marine Corps um, and uh, National Guard. My sister and her husband are retired Air Force. Um, my brother-in-law was retired Navy. Um, who else? My cousins. Two of my cousins are retired Navy. One was in the Marine Corps. So I mean, we've got. But it wasn't expected. That's just what happened. Right. But you um, had a lot of influence. Yeah. And, uh, I don't know. Familiarly. Yeah. Yeah. But it was, like I said, it wasn't expected. It was just something that people did. Right. Um, you know, I've, very, I've always been patriotic. Mm -hmm. You know, I love my country. I wanted to um, help not necessarily defend her, but support her. Yeah. You know, so I felt that being on being on active duty was a great way to do it. My parents did not agree in paying for college, so I had to find my training somewhere else. Right. Um, and where I grew, I wasn't good enough in school to get scholarships, I thought, but I never applied either, so, you know. Um, I just, so, you know, did it change how I felt about it? Yeah, it just made me more passionate about it. Okay. And, and um, last question is, um, how did your service and experiences affect your life? Oh, profoundly. Um, I mean, how can it not? I spent 20 years of my life, um, you know, being told what to do, when to do it, how to do it, where to live, how to dress, sometimes what to think and how to think. But at the same time, I was given responsibilities that most people don't ever get to do. I was given opportunities that most people don't ever get to do. Um, it's it changes you in ways that you don't even realize. You know, my formative years as an adult were spent on active duty. So in a way, leaving was really hard. I lost my full identity when I retired. And I had a lot of um, emotional and psychological trauma from that. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're on active duty and you wear that uniform, everybody knows who you are and where you've been. Your name's there. 
You know, they can tell where what your command you're in. They can see your ribbons and see what you've done. They know, um, especially in the Navy, based on your rating badge, they know what your job is. Everything's right there on you. You know, and then when you're in the civilian sector, unless you're wearing scrubs or something else, people don't know a damn thing about you. Right. So you lose that identity, you lose that camaraderie. Um, I found out that the civilian world was a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. Um, it was a real struggle. And then going through uh, my master's in counseling and psychology, you know, part of your coursework is you, you counsel each other in class. Mm. And so I realized even more so, pr more profoundly, how much losing that identity was really traumatizing. And, you know, even today I still struggle a little bit with, you know, thinking about why don't they just do their damn job? It's not that hard. Just, you know, that's what you're hired for. Just do it, get it over with, quit trying to find a way out or an easy fix. You know, um, when we came back from Japan, or when, not when we came back from Japan, when I got one of my first jobs, we stood, uh, we had an on-call pager, and we we held it like once a month, if that. And and we got paid for it. I was like, ooh, we get paid for being on call. And people were complaining about how often they were on call. I was like, I stood a three-section 24-hour watch, and it was a non-sleeping post. I mean, sometimes we got to sleep, but not always. Um, I didn't get paid for it, and I still had to do a 40-hour week, so what are you guys complaining about? So it took me a long time to get rid of my military mindset to a point where I can be more functional and acceptable in the civilian sector. Okay. Um, this is a very dangerous question for you. Okay. All right, um, but we out of time. Yeah. <laughs> so... I'll keep it. I'll try to keep it brief. No, no I, I don't want an answer. <laughs> okay. I'm just going to ask it, but then I've, we, we've got got to, you okay. know, because we've got to move on. Yeah. I'm supposed to say, is there anything that you would like to add that we have not covered? <laughs> 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 and and I already know the answer, so I'm just going to have to go ahead and thank you so much. You're welcome. Uh, you, I can tell that you're like a plethora of information, <laughs> and you probably have another five thousand six hundred and seventy-five stories to tell. <laughs> <laughs> Minimally, but um, I really, really appreciate uh, um, you. First of all, thank you for your service. Thank you. Thank you for your service. And and thank you for a, a fabulous interview. And just to share with you, so you'll have it for. Um, you can always stop it right here. Okay. Uh, I also both my parents served in World War II. Oh wow! And my father and his brothers and my mother and her sister. Wow, that's um, awesome. And it was a variety. I was Air Force. Uh, there was one Navy, and everybody else was Army. So. Um, Thank you so much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. This was neat.